Georgine was once full of potential, poised to become a renowned movie star in the future. However, fate had something entirely different in store for her. One fateful day, just steps away from reaching her home, she vanished without a trace. In the summer of 2006, 14-year-old Georgine Kruger moved with her family to Berlin. Her parents had divorced a few years prior, and she now lived with her mother and her younger sister. Her older brother Tommy, who was 22 at the time, lived on his own. As the new girl in class, Georgine found it difficult to make friends. The other girls in school were not fond of the attention she received from the boys, who were drawn to her looks. Though Georgine wasn't fully aware of the extent of her popularity, she took great care of her appearance, always wearing the latest trends and enjoying makeup. Georgine dreamed of becoming an actress and even considered modeling as a possible career. She often danced in front of the mirror, trying out different outfits, imagining herself on a grand stage. Her love for movies, especially Indian films, inspired her as she practiced the actors' moves and sang along to their songs while watching TV. On Friday, September 22, 2006, it seemed like her dreams were on the verge of coming true. Georgine had been offered a small role in the film Turkish for Beginners. She was told that she would receive a call on Monday, September 25, with a final decision. Filming was set to take place during the upcoming fall break, and Georgine eagerly anticipated the news. Over the weekend, the wait felt endless for her as she looked forward to confirming the role she had long hoped for. Monday, September 25, 2006, finally arrived. Despite being distracted, Georgine managed to get through her school day. She hurried home after class, determined not to miss the call from the agency. After leaving school, she headed straight to the bus stop, boarded bus number 27, and traveled just a few stops before getting off. From there, she had only a few feet to walk before reaching her house. Around 2 p.m., she was seen getting off the bus. At home, her grandmother and younger sister had already prepared lunch and were waiting for Georgine to join them, but she never arrived. At 2 p.m., her grandmother tried calling her, but there was no answer. Concerned, she wondered if perhaps Georgine had missed the bus or stopped to talk to someone. As time continued to pass, another attempt to call went straight to voicemail, and her grandmother's worry grew. Her grandmother decided to contact the school to check if anything unusual had happened. The school confirmed that Georgine had attended all her classes and left for home as usual. Her teacher did mention that Georgine seemed distracted that day, but her grandmother knew why. Georgine had been eagerly awaiting the call from the casting agency all weekend. As more time passed, her grandmother grew increasingly anxious. When Georgine's mother returned home, she was informed of the situation and immediately felt that something was wrong. It was entirely out of character for Georgine not to show up on time or contact her family. She was always punctual and responsible. Her phone, too, was never switched off. Her mother quickly called the police to report her daughter's disappearance. Initially, the police considered several possibilities, could Georgine have run away? Had she gotten into a disagreement with family or friends, or maybe done something impulsive in the name of teenage love? However, it was crucial to remember that Georgine had been expecting an important call from the casting agency that day, and she wouldn't have missed it for the world. When Georgine was last seen, she was wearing light blue ripped jeans, ankle-high brown heeled boots, and a white denim jacket. She also carried a pink backpack with long straps and had her mobile phone with her, which was later found to be switched off. By tracking the phone, detectives determined that the device had been active at 2.06 p.m., but by 2.08 p.m., it was turned off. It seemed unlikely that Georgine, so close to her home, would have suddenly changed her mind and gone elsewhere, especially when she was eagerly waiting for the casting agency's call. 
She was seen getting off bus number 27, confirming that she had been just minutes away from her house. A large search operation was launched in the neighborhood where the Kruger family lived, but Georgine was never seen again. All nearby attics and basements were thoroughly searched, with police using trained dogs to detect human remains. Investigators questioned local residents, Georgine's classmates, and checked into several offenders. Investigators considered suspects who were either out on bail or had recently been released from prison. The Kruger family distributed flyers with Georgine's photo, and posters with her description were put up throughout the district. Her mother personally went door to door, seeking any clues about her daughter's whereabouts. Despite these extensive efforts, the investigation stalled with no substantial leads. Georgine seemed to have disappeared into thin air just feet away from her home. Weeks turned into months, and three years after her broad daylight disappearance, a second search operation was organized. This time, search dogs were used again, trained not only to detect human remains but also to find living individuals. The dogs started their search from the bus stop, but instead of leading investigators to the Kruger home, they were directed toward the suburbs. Police searched the wooded area but found no trace of the girl's presence. It wasn't surprising given the difficulty of tracking a scent after three years. Unfortunately, the renewed efforts didn't yield any new leads, and the case remained stagnant. Years later, in 2016, another search was conducted, this time with a glimmer of hope for results. Residents of the neighborhood where the Kruger family lived were once again interviewed, and there was a small breakthrough. Neighbors recalled a 30-year-old unemployed man who had lived in the area. He spent hours on his porch watching teenagers pass by, seemingly enjoying the view. He was frequently seen engaging young girls in conversation, often saying inappropriate things and asking provocative questions, like whether they had ever been with boys, hinting that he could help them with such matters. This man, identified as Ali, was known to downplay his age and present himself as younger to win the attention of teenage girls. Although the girls didn't fear him, they found him odd and kept their distance, which made the neighbors take notice of his behavior. Ali lived in the same apartment complex as the Kruger family. He had three children and lived with his wife. Unemployed and struggling with debt, he took on odd jobs and relied on social benefits to make ends meet. Despite his financial struggles, Ali had a fascination with luxury cars and fashion, even though he could only dream of owning them. When he wasn't watching the girls, Ali would spend his free time in a Turkish cafe located on the ground floor of the apartment building, meeting with acquaintances. Though he didn't have close friends, he regularly interacted with locals. The police paid close attention to the testimony about his suspicious behavior and checked his criminal history. In 2011, Ali had been involved in a violent incident where he lured a 17-year-old neighbor into his basement. The girl had been walking home with a friend when Ali, standing on the porch of his house, offered her a new mobile phone. Tempted by the offer, the girl hesitated but eventually followed him to the basement, where he claimed the phone was stored. However, there was no phone waiting for her. Instead, Ali confessed that he had been in love with her for a long time and was willing to leave his wife just to be with her. When the girl rejected his advances, Ali struck her on the back of the neck, causing her to collapse. He then sat on top of her, and despite her efforts to resist and scream, the girl was unable to fight him off. After the assault, Ali handed her a tissue to dry her tears and threatened her to keep quiet, warning her not to tell anyone, not her family, friends, or the police. The girl nodded in agreement, but once she escaped the basement, she headed straight to the police station and reported everything, pointing directly to Ali. She also gave a detailed description of the basement, mentioning specific details that confirmed her story. According to her, the basement looked more like a personal hideout where Ali spent his free time, rather than a cluttered storage space. In 2012, Ali was sentenced to a year and a half of probation for assaulting the 17-year-old girl, along with charges of bodily harm. During his trial, Ali claimed that the girl had asked for a mobile phone and followed him voluntarily. He denied any wrongdoing, asserting that he wouldn't jeopardize his family's well-being, 
and accused the girl of fabricating the story. However, the girl's account matched with the evidence, and Ollie was found guilty. This case bore eerie similarities to Georgine's disappearance. Both girls had been returning home after school and vanished in the same area where Ollie had previously attacked another teenage girl. According to the phone data, Georgine disappeared just down the street from where Ollie lived. Georgine would have had to pass by Ollie's door in any case. Could Ollie have intercepted her somehow? The issue was that the search dogs showed no interest in the basement of Ali's house, and detectives lacked specific evidence, no witness statements, no DNA, nothing concrete to tie him to the crime. The only notable detail was that on the day of Georgine's disappearance, both her phone and Ali's were detected in the same area. While this could suggest they were together, it might simply indicate that they lived on the same street. Interrogating Ali seemed futile without substantial proof, as he would likely deny any involvement in Georgine's disappearance. As a result, the authorities decided to use a rather unconventional strategy. They began monitoring Ali's phone calls. Over weeks of surveillance, they discovered that Ali was in financial trouble. He was gambling and had accumulated significant debt. The police decided to exploit this weakness. Rather than engaging in a long-term and costly operation, they chose to infiltrate Ali's circle. An undercover officer was assigned to the case, with a mission to gain Ali's trust and gather any information related to Georgine Kruger's disappearance. Posing as a successful businessman looking to open a car wash in Berlin, the officer introduced himself at the Turkish cafe that Ali frequented. The cafe, conveniently located in the same building where Ali lived, became the perfect spot for the officer to establish contact with the suspect. The operation was expected to take time, as any sudden move could arouse Ali's suspicions. The officer gradually became familiar with the cafe regulars, sharing his story about wanting to start a car wash business in the area. He mentioned that he was looking for a manager with a good salary, which piqued Ali's interest, especially given his financial struggles. Soon, the officer and Ali became inseparable, even taking a business trip to Frankfurt together, deepening their bond. Ali began to believe that his life was about to change, envisioning himself as the manager of the new car wash. He tried to present himself as a respectable man, eager not to lose out on the lucrative job opportunity. Ali thought that if everything went according to plan, his financial troubles would be over, and he could finally afford the lifestyle and luxury cars he had always dreamed of. Despite their growing friendship, however, no progress was made in the case of Georgine's disappearance. To move things forward, the authorities introduced another undercover agent, codenamed Susie, into the operation. According to the cover story, Susie was the officer's girlfriend. Eager to seize the opportunity, Ali offered to take care of the blackmailer himself and began planning the crime, discussing logistics such as the girl's weight, whether a car would be needed, and the best location for the attack. As Ali planned, the trap tightened. During these discussions, Ali confessed to the cousin that he had researched online how to dispose of a body. Letting Ali talk freely, the undercover agent avoided any signs of entrapment. Eventually, Ali opened up about Georgine's disappearance. He described her as a beautiful young girl who passed by his door every day on her way home from school. On September 25, 2006, he was waiting at his usual spot when Georgine stepped off the bus. That day, she was in a good mood, smiling and radiant. Ali approached her, asking for help carrying some bags to his basement, offering to pay her for the favor. Knowing her neighbor and suspecting no danger, Georgine agreed. But once inside, Ali struck her on the head. She screamed in pain, so he hit her again, harder this time. Georgine lost consciousness and collapsed. Ali lamented his actions, but he knew that if he let her go, he would face prison. So, he strangled her until she stopped breathing. Ali's detailed account of the assault was too vivid to be fabricated, and his story matched known facts. After killing Georgine, he hid her body in the basement for three days before wrapping her in an old rug and disposing of her in the trash. 
Investigators later confirmed that all trash was incinerated, meaning Georgine's remains were completely destroyed. Ali's confession was enough to arrest him. In December 2018, 12 years after Georgine's disappearance, Ali was taken into custody while at home with his daughter. All of his properties were searched, but no physical evidence was found linking him to the missing girl. During questioning, Ali remained silent. He did not speak when charged and continued to say nothing in court. He remained in custody for a year and a half. While his family was confident he would be acquitted due to the lack of physical evidence, no DNA, no body, no witnesses, his confession was enough. The prosecution compared Ali's previous convictions with his statements, finding striking similarities in his criminal behavior. Ultimately, it was his detailed account of the day Georgine disappeared that convinced the jury and judge of his guilt in the death of 14-year-old Georgine Kruger, a girl who might have achieved fame in the film industry. The news of her neighbor's arrest and conviction devastated her family. On March 17, 2020, Ali was sentenced to life imprisonment. He later claimed to be a victim, stating that he had agreed to act as a hitman for the cousin's girlfriend to protect her from danger. He intended to expose the cousin's plan to the police, but despite his claims of innocence, his confession spoke for itself. Surprisingly, Ali's family believes he was wrongfully convicted, arguing that the police spent too much time and money trying to incriminate him. They feel the crime was pinned on him to justify the resources spent. Only Ali knows the full truth, and perhaps one day, his conscience will compel him to fully admit his guilt.